Uh, Xavier's here to uh, speak about indicators of the crap. Uh, I'm sure that would be good for us. Uh, Xavier Ash is currently the VP of Security Engineering at SunTrust. He's a Georgia Institute of Tech alumnus. He has 25 years of hands on experience in information security. Working for Verizon, for various security vendors and consulting firms for the last 15 years, including IBM, Gartner, and Harvard Black. Xavier is focused on helping secure companies of all sizes. Xavier was the first hire to start up Drawbridge Networks, where he was instrumental in bringing the first micro segmentation solution for servers and workstations to market. Mr. Ash holds many industry certifications, including CISN, CISSP, ITIL, SOA, and others. In a few minutes, I have spent with Xavier. It's clear that he is shy. So please be accommodating and welcome. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, so yeah, end of the day, and uh, uh, there's a lot of very technical talks. You probably learned a whole lot of stuff. And I'm just going to get up here and, and, and complain for the next 45 minutes. Hopefully give you a little bit of entertainment, keep you awake so we get to the uh, fun part of getting all the free stuff, right? <laughs> so today, uh, I wanted to kind of go off on about uh, indicators of compromise. A lot of you guys have probably been introduced to this concept before, uh, and so we're going to go through a couple aspects of it, and hopefully you'll take away something. If not, you know, you're just here for the free stuff after I'm done talking. So. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm old. I've been around, uh, started uh, hacking in the late 80s. Uh, anybody here go to the 2600 meetings? 2600 meetings? Yep, yep. Late 80s, early 90s, they were still doing it. Same place, the, the, the Linux Mall food court. Uh, we, were, we were dragging in uh, pay phones that we ripped off and all sorts of stuff uh, into that uh, uh, food court. So it's yeah, pretty interesting. I love that it's still going on. Um, so like I said, I've been working for a bunch of companies. I did uh, consulting for a lot of my uh, career, so I've had lots of little, really interesting experiences. Uh, a couple of years back, I decided, you know, I was done telling people how to do security, and I went back into doing security, started doing, uh, taking corporate roles, and uh, so, uh, so back into uh, that role, leading a, a group of uh, really great uh, engineers at uh, at, a, at a bank that uh, soon will be the uh, uh, sixth largest bank in, in, the, in the nation. So pretty, pretty excited about that. Um, and uh, so there, there's a couple of my contacts information. So. Um, all right, so what is an IOC? I start off, I got a little stuff, make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So they are things that indicate compromise, right? All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so who, whose fault is this? What are we dealing with? So, What's interesting about, uh, uh, I, I did some research on this, uh, Richard Betchelick, I uh, wrote a great a number of books. He uh, was a, a historian by, uh, by uh, education, and so he did a historical look to see when uh, did we actually start using the term indicators of compromise. Now he found a bunch of books that decided that, yeah, uh, we said the term indicators, probably in around you know, mid-90s or so. Uh, indicators of compromise even was used, but the, the actual use of the term as like a thing uh, was right around uh, as, uh, about the same time, both from Mandiant. Uh, their first uh, Mandiant MTrans report uh, published on uh, January 25th, 2010. Uh, and then about the, uh, so it says the next day on January 26th, Matt Frazier publishes the combat, the APT by sharing indicators of compromise to the Mandiant blog. Forever changing our world and making IOCs a thing. Now, I, I want you to take a quick note about how, what is an indicator. That's probably not what you guys think of as what an indicator is. That's a lot more advanced than what an indicator is. We've lost a little bit of education along the way. So in 2010, that's what an indicator was. And so now, uh, because of their lovely ABT reports, we all must collect all the IOCs. All right, so IOC Bonanza, let's think about all the different things IOCs can be. Most of us are not used to thinking of IOCs and you know, IP addresses, hashes, uh, URLs, file names, but there's a couple other interesting ones, and we'll get into some of these and, and, uh, and dive into how crappy each of them are. Uh, but we've got uh, registry keys and values, uh, email subject lines, I love that one because you know that one's very consistent, right? 
Uh, but uh, uh, some good one there is, is the TLS certificate numbers. All right, we've got a lot of stolen certificates. I work for Bit9, I can talk to this. Um, and, um, and, and we've got uh, service names, coin addresses. Anybody use uh, Bitcoin addresses in any of the reports? Right. Uh, MAC addresses, string, and geolocation. So a lot of different things that can be misused. A lot of, a lot of opportunity for misuse. Now, what the geolocation thing? We actually use a lot of geolocation stuff, but um, <coughs> any geography nerds out there? <laughs> all right, so the center of the nation all right, it's in northern Kansas, near the Nebraska border. Uh, its center spot is uh, 29 degrees, 50, uh, 50 uh, uh, north, 98 degrees, 35 uh, west, which comes out to, in the digital map, is 39.83333 and negative 98.5.85522. So back in 2002, when a little company called MaxMind, Everybody use Max Binds now? I was first using their digital point to say, what is the center that they, they said? Yeah, close enough. We're going to use negative 30 or 38, um, 38.0 and negative 97.0 as, as their default location. Well, this default location ended up in the front yard of this poor groups or poor, poor families of uh, Kansas home. Uh, this was James and uh, Teresa Arnold. The, the uh, plaintiffs were repeatedly awakened from their sleep, disturbed from their daily activities by local, state, and federal officials looking for a runaway child, missing person, evidence of computer fraud, or a call uh, for an attempted suicide. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a complaint that they filed that actually sued MaxMind. Uh, I thought this was a very interesting story, uh, how much we dedicate ourselves on, on to uh, uh, our geolocation information. So if you have an APT coming from central Kansas, you probably should look at your data again. That's, that's the default location. But there's lots of interesting stories about how we've gotten geo locations wrong. Um, we have uh, interesting where geo locations are different from different systems. And so uh, this system says it's in North Korea. This one says Canada. Yeah, close, you know. <laughs> so. All right, so how can I get me some of these IOCs? All right, first, we stay them from the internet, right? So there's lots of free IOCs out there. You generally get what you pay for, but there's a, there's a really good place to start. There's uh, some good places to, uh, to start looking for all of these. Um, Threat Connect, I'll talk a little bit about that in the future. Uh, we've got uh, threatconnect.com slash free. Uh, it's a good list of, of places. Now you have to create a Threat Connect account to get to those. Uh, there's a couple of uh, things on GitHub that I found, uh, but uh, lots of good uh, places to get lots of IOCs, because that's what you need, right? Is, is lots and lots of IOCs. And, and uh, especially when your boss comes in and says, we need to get some of these IOCs. Why aren't you checking the IOCs? We need some IOCs. You can get some free ones. All right, so then the next is you can pay for them. This is the lovely one. So this is a company that, that says, we are going to sell security threat intelligence. <laughs> ah, I got one of your laugh. All right, threat intelligence. I used to work for IBM. IBM, uh, I, I was uh, part of uh, Tivoli, and then I was part of uh, the security group. And then we bought uh, Cube Radar, and Cube Radar was not a sim. It was threat intelligence. Uh, so then uh, they said, well, uh, hold on. Well, not, not that threat intelligence, because there's all these other companies selling threat intelligence. And those threat intelligence companies are actually selling IOCs with some reports. And so it was very confusing for the marketing folks over at IBM to say, no, we really meant sim, not, not IOCs. But there are some good, uh, uh, I think the most enterprises you, you work for, you're going to have uh, some level of, uh, of, of this paid for. And they do provide IOC feeds. They also provide reports and a lot of context around those. And so please don't take these fairly expensive services and say, yeah, I'm just pulling all the IP addresses off of our recorded futures feed or anomaly or whatever you've got. So uh, uh, be sure to understand the context, and we'll, we'll understand how to put this data together as we go forward. Uh, get lucky, you already paid for them. So this is where uh, I had uh, uh, I heard this thing called Cisco Talos. Anybody know what Cisco Talos is? Good data, uh, good um, threat intelligence company, does lots of good stuff. Do you know how you get threat, uh, Cisco Talos threat feeds? Can you go buy them? Anybody know? No, you get them when you buy Cisco equipment, right? So if you buy Cisco, uh, their, their WSA, the, 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 uh, their, their IPS, any of their, their security equipment, you get all of that, that valuable stuff. And so 
So some of these you might actually be able to get, you know, threat intelligence or IRCs from some of the existing equipment you have. Uh, some of the uh, other ones that don't kind of restrict, uh, but allow you to get an additional if you actually have a product. Uh, X Force Exchange from IBM, uh, CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike it's, a, it's an add-on, but uh, either way, uh, if you think that you you go and you ask, do we have any threat intelligence companies? Uh, and your, your you know, sourcing team says, no, we, never, we don't want to pay for that. Go look at the, the security tools you have. They're probably going to have their own level of threat intelligence leads. Now, the most valuable one that I'm going to say is, is the ones that you make up yourself. So I want to get, uh, get a good idea of who we got in here. So how many people are blue teamers? They're going to use IOCs to catch bad guys. Raise your hands. All right, so how many of us are... Um, uh, incident responders, uh, forensics folks that break it, break things apart to find IOCs after things have been broken. So we handful of those. All right, who are uh, NSA guys here just listening to get collect information? Here? <laughs> <laughs> handful of those. All right. Um, <coughs> so uh, when you make them up, what I'm saying here is that you need to generate your own IOCs, and and this is from all of your uh, your your current uh, technologies that, that protect you. Uh, that you know all that noise from the front end, uh, IPSs and firewalls, all of those virus detection alerts that you you know you probably ignore, those are indicators of compromise, and they're very valuable because those are the ones that are threatening you. Because I'm going to get to later on how to prioritize these, but if you're already being attacked by them, that's pretty high priority. So get if you're not currently have an IOC program where you are are, are, are are taking in the IOCs that your SOC is generating on an ongoing basis, this needs to be a priority for you. All right, curating and collecting. Let's talk about a couple of these. I'm not, I didn't want to spend too much time on, on each of these, but some great uh, places to start that collection and curation. Talk about how you deal with all of your IOCs. All right, uh, MISP. Anybody in here use MISP? Uh, this is Malware Information Sharing Protocol. Or a platform, yeah, MISP is good. Open source uh, tool. Another good one is CRIT. Uh, I was just being told earlier this morning about how awesome CRIT is, and it's so much better than MISP, and you should you so totally use CRIT instead of MISP. Uh, a couple of others that, that are out there that I've, I've, I've used. Now, I've always liked Alien, Alien Vault. It's always got some you know, good stuff out there. You've got a pretty good community. I don't know what happened, but sometime, I guess last year, AT&T bought them, so just FYI. Uh, they are an F and they are an AT&T company. I don't know if that makes it better or not, but uh, uh, and more information. Threat Connect is, is uh, I always point to these guys because at some point at DEF CON when I was at a good, that perfect inebriation where I'm coming up with really good ideas, I completely thought of Threat Connect like, like eight years ago. Like, oh, dude, we're going to keep this thing in the cloud. We're going to get all these IFCs. We're going to put them together. We're going to make it awesome. And then like when Threat Connect came out, I'm like, Hey, I already thought of that. I should have actually done it. Uh, but yeah, Threat Connect is, is a, a pretty good uh, software as a service uh, uh, for, for doing this type of uh, collection and curating of, of your threat information. Uh, Pulse Live is another. Uh, and then and now I want to throw out these, these other terms here in case you get, uh, get them thrown at you. So Open IOCs is, uh, is so open that Mandiant has used it. Uh, a couple of others do now, uh, or still do, but it generally has been moved uh, more to more common uh, um, uh, formats, uh, taxi and sticks. Everybody's been wrestled around with some of these open source tools trying to get those six feeds, but this is basically the, uh, the, the uh, kind of common language between sharing uh, these, these IOCs and other uh, types of vulnerability information. Uh, I think it's Mike or Make, I always forget how to pronounce that. Uh, the malware attribu uh, attributable, attributable Enumeration and characterization. There we go. That's probably why not many people use it. So if somebody asked me to throw that in because that, that was so much better than sticks, which since I've wrestled with sticks so many times, I can, I can definitely uh, attest to that. And then uh, Cybox, which now is part of sticks, uh, but throw that up there for all those old folks that, that used to use it back in the day. All right, so we start generating our own IOCs, or we're collecting them, or we're stealing them, how, whatever we're doing with them. And so, yeah, we got enemies. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about IOC lifecycle. IOC lifecycle is that these IOCs do not live forever. We need to throw them out. We need to be able to say, sorry, 
that domain is, uh, is no good anymore, that IP address is no good anymore. So when you create this program, make sure that you're not just feeding a database that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but you have put life, you put a lifetime on each of your IOCs. Make sure this is part of your program. All right, so how, how to do threat hunting with IOC. So step one is don't. Right? Threat, this is not threat hunting. Okay? Uh, so this, I'm going to pull up this guy from uh, also uh, good old Richard here uh, from his uh, pra the practice of network security monitoring from our lovely, guy, lovely guys over at No Star Express 2013. So uh, I, I followed him a lot uh, over the years. You know, I did a lot of sim work as a consultant and uh, he's got a lot of really good approaches. But I love this. He called it up. Uh, so over IOC centric analysis or matching versus IOC free analysis or hunting. This was you know, 2013, very early on in this whole life of, of the IOCs, but it clearly says that, that this is, uh, uh, if you're doing IOC matching, do not call yourself a threat hunter. Now, threat hunting can start with IOCs. I'm not going to get into how to do threat hunting, that's, a, that's another rant, but this is uh, just make sure that you, you're clearly articulate about what you're doing and it is not threat hunting if you're just using IRCs. All right, so if you're going to do this matching, <clears throat> do you have the data to begin with? Now, the, you know, we, we, the previous slide, all this great stuff, you know, maybe you're paying for it, and uh, uh, like I like the one is, is mutexes and other things that you can only get if you're really doing forensic analysis. But if you are a blue teamer, and that's why I put SOC up here, if you're part of the blue team that has to defend and do this kind of uh, IOC matching on an ongoing basis, then you probably have things like IPs, URLs, domains. This is all coming in as from feeds of your existing uh, platforms. But do you have something out there that actually can scan and produce registry key and values? All right, there's a couple of tools out there uh, you know, that can do you know, uh, on-demand question answer. Uh, they can do some scanning. But what about ongoing mo uh, monitoring? Right? So think of your tools and say if you're, you're going to get these as IFCs, make sure that you can match them up on, on a real-time basis. If that, if that is your use case. Now if you don't want to, then, it's, then you're, you're pushing this off to your forensics team that once they get the image or they get whatever, that they can then do the matching. But don't expect to be able to do a registry key matching if you're not producing that on an ongoing basis. TLS search uh, is another one. I, I really think that this is a very important thing. <clears throat> Not only because I worked for Bit9 for a while and we, we made a big deal about this, but there's a lot of use cases of being able to know uh, those digital signatures are really useful. That helps us to, you know, to definitely determine. You don't have to necessarily do hash lookups to be able to determine good or bad. When you're doing a big analysis, uh, you know, the forensics teams know they, they, they basically do a big whitelist and want to make sure they get away all, all the known good out of the way. And you can easily do this with, with search serials, but that, uh, that finding uh, those stolen search uh, serials in your environment is really a high fidelity indicator. But if you're not looking for them, you, you know, it's only the forensics guys that are going to get it, and that's way after you've already been out. So look at your, your, your tools and figure out how you can start pulling those in. There's a lot of EDR tools that sometimes look at. Um, is if you've got it configured, if you've actually turned it on, so, so make sure that that's part of it. Uh, coin addresses. So um, anybody in here that actually has a security tool that automatically pulls those out for you? Anybody? Yeah, all right, one. All right, so uh, this is something I've configured in, in Bro. I've configured in uh, proxies. You know, looking for uh, coin traffic. Not just because I'm afraid of uh, miners landing in my system, which that's, that's what I tell my boss, because that's the big you know, scare. But there are people doing Bitcoin transactions, and it would be interesting to see, be able to see that. And if you can capture that in some of your, your network analysis or, or, or web browser analysis, uh, very, and again, high fidelity IRC is there. All right, MAC address is one of those good ones. You know, it's, uh, uh, because nobody really cares about MAC addresses until this last uh, wave of, of supply chain attacks with, uh, who was it? ASUS, ASUS right? Did, did, did you get the list of, of, of MAC addresses that, you know, go and check your, I think I have them. I mean, I had an ASUS motherboard and I go check it. Uh, and file hashes. I'm gonna, file hashes I put in is rare because 
unless, uh, so, so there are certain types of software, I used to work for one that, that did a complete state table of your environment, knew exactly where every executable file was, create a big old database, it's really hard to run. But it really was very useful in knowing exactly what every single file hash is. Now to do that, once you install that agent, it's got to scan the entire drive, it's got to send that data back to a, you know, a database, and you've got to keep up with all that. That's a heavy lift for a lot of company, a lot of software, and, and, and so a lot of EDR products, they really don't get that, uh, that, that um, hash until it executes or it's written or some, some other type of trigger, so I don't have to do a full scan. So when you think that you have a database of your, of your file hashes in your environment, really think about it. How did I get those file hashes? When is that file hash executed and, and, and so that I can know that I have a complete answer? All right, so uh, if so, this is with uh, you know, if you're in SOC, right? Uh, the, I was able to find a, a, a graphic of uh, for all of you forensics guys that are using this because it's a little bit easier. Uh, so there you go. That, that's where my forensics guys sitting there you know, going to town because once you have the image there, it's pretty much uh, you know that's what a lot of forensics you know processes do is they are scanning your, you know those images, making sure that you have. Uh, that you can extract out strings and mutexes and, and uh, uh, all sorts of really good juicy information. So when you're looking at your list of IOCs, figuring out how to use them, understand that some of them are for the blue team and for ongoing monitoring, and some of them are for your, for your forensics. And, uh, and then your forensics team are going to help you feed these IOCs back into your system, right? Because you're going to get, uh, uh, get this set up so that you're actually you know, creating your own IOCs moving forward. All right, so let's talk about, dive into a couple of these more in detail. So IP addresses. Uh, best, best way, you know, easiest way of getting, uh, I started with IOCs is to you know, get your proxy logs, your firewall logs, get a list of bad IP addresses. I think, is, is the Zeus uh, list still, I think that's still the thing, right? So we can still have, we still have uh, Zeus infections out there, and so there's a specific uh, open source I IRC for Zeus, and, and match up. So if I got connection up to this IP address, that, that means that guy's infected, right? So I'm going to automate that and automatically re-image that guy's laptop as soon as he sends a IP address out there. All right. If you haven't got the joke, if you didn't get the joke, the problem is is that IP address uh, IOCs has an extremely low fidelity, in so much that I say don't use them in this manner. All right, so I, I went ahead and said, nope, this is just crap. All right, IOCs, uh, uh, IP addresses. This is more like security intelligence, right? This is more context. If your SIM or your ability to monitoring has a way of like coloring or adding context to the traffic coming in, I would add a tag saying that this, uh, this, is, this, this IP address has been known to, you know, you know, is a Zeus IP. Then you can start doing some of the threat hunting. But do not do any type of automatic ticket creation or, or uh, metrics or anything based on this because you're going to look like you're completely owned. Now, if you're trying to get security funding and that's what you want to do, then that's a great time. But unless you're, you know, unless you're just trying to, to fudge the numbers, absolutely avoid IP addresses. So domain names. This is another one that, that comes down in the, uh, a lot of the, the I, I did, some in, did some investigation on this because I, I think that there's some, some pretty good information about how to do domain name IOCs. One thing, uh, I work for a company that, uh, uh, I won't say that my existing company, but love to block these top level domains. <laughs> dot whatever is bad, right? We got a couple of attacks from dot band. So let's just block dot band, right? So I was able to pull this information out. This one, this, this data is fairly recent from the anti-phishing working group. It shows that you know, for the last quarter of last year, over half of the, the stuff that we're getting from uh, uh, phishing attacks, the .com and, the, and the, what's called the uh, traditional TLDs, I think it's 2002, before they started creating the new weird ones, uh, all, you know, over half of them come from that. And the other one, uh, the other gray slice there is country level, .uk, .co.uk, you know, those type of things. So a vast majority of even the phishing attacks are still using standard, uh, uh, so, so top level domains is not, a, not necessarily a good uh, uh, fidelity there. 
So, uh, so push back on your folks that want to just block top level domains. There's really no reason to do that. But new domains are evil. I tried to find some good data on this. This, the, uh, the, this anti phishing worm group stopped c collecting information in 2016. I'd seen something recently, but couldn't find it for this presentation. But the, the, this, this situation has only gotten a little bit worse. But you can see from this data, if you can see the data, but it basically shows that the, the highest bar there says that my oldest domains is uh, between three days and one week. I've seen data that shows that uh, that now we're up to like uh, between you know like three days is old, like 72 hours is like the, the average lifetime for a phishing domain. They pop them up, they send the emails out, and you know our sock is pretty good about bam phishing takedown. Go risk IQ or whatever vendor you use. Go take down those vendors. But the thing is, is that uh, is that that's not uh, a good use of IOCs because you know necessarily is 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 that you've got the process of getting all those domains up to this uh, security intelligence company that's going to feed you all these domains. They're going to be gone uh, within a couple of days. So domains in general uh, is is low fidelity. Uh, but that if you have a process of being able to look at the age of that domain in real time as you're doing uh, your proxying and your blocking, this could be a way of easily uh, uh, you know, solving some of the phishing attack problems. All right, so uh, file hashes. So this is a bad guy. He's been used in lots of attacks, APT1, APT22, APT, blah, 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 blah. So you should definitely block this hash. <laughs> Okay, just block it over. I actually went to a company that had this set to, it wasn't blocked, uh, but it was locked down. They, they put like a, uh, they put, they pushed a domain uh, um, GPO object out that says, uh, you know, all the administrators can run net.exe. They found out that even like WinZip install uses net.exe. Everything uses net.exe, but the point is, is that you know, there is a limitation on, 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 on using file hashes. Especially if you're going to start generating your own. So don't get overzealous and start you know, automating a lot of this because you'll end up blocking something very important. Now, one way that, uh, uh, that we can fix this is if you're checking for a certificate. Right? If I'm looking at you know, if this is signed by Microsoft, probably okay. All right, <laughs> stop using MD5. <laughs> every company, every tool that I've got will use. MD5. Everybody still can process MD5. The MISP and, and my, my security controls and everything like that, they, they can use it. But if we stop using it, they will stop making it and stop supporting it. And so let's all just ensure that we are at least using SHA-256. Uh, and then I always love the use of uh, fuzzy hashes. This has been particularly used when you're looking at you know, actual malware that does uh, polymorphic, all the you know, big words to make it look a little bit different. Um, they're also creating some good uh, research on fuzzy hashes for uh, all the word and, and macro viruses that we're having to deal with. So uh, definitely look into that. So uh, again, um, the forensic guys in here probably know this process, but the, the idea is that you take uh, your uh, gold image, whatever, scan it, put all those known good hashes into your database. So when you're creating your IOC you know, plan, is that you're creating all these IOCs from all these uh, you know, virus detection and EDR and stuff like that. You're feeding all these known bad. Do, you know, build your own deck. Understand what your known good is. You got lots, lots of software out there that you, you're probably developed on your own. You know, get, get a process in where you start scanning those hashes as they're pushed out to your environment, you know, through SCCM or whatever automation, and get, make sure you know what your known good is. So all of this, you know, like I was describing to a non-layperson, uh, to a lay, lay person, okay, about what, uh, you know, what is next-gen AV, right? Well, it, it you know, it, it's, it's, it looks at the behavior of stuff, and it looks for the signature, and the signature's bad. It's like, the signature, like a, you mean the hash or the signature? And so make sure that you understand that if you set up your EDR, EDR tool, and, and pretty much the only feature you're using on that is to look for, uh, you know, to, to scan your, your, your files 
and then check against virus total or something like that, you, you're doing something slightly worse than, than uh, the, the, the old AV. So this is not, a, you know, that, that, that core use case is not going to bring much value. Um, and so uh, not to say that it's not part of a complete breakfast, but it is something that you don't want to do only. So uh, while I gave IP addresses the, uh, uh, the, the crap, um, I'm thinking, all right, so hashes, <laughs> hashes we'll, we'll use. All right, we'll keep, we'll keep hashes in. So I, you know, I, I was looking through this, you know, living through this, this situation a couple of years back when we were going from, uh, you know, the, the kind of static uh, signature-based detections into the CDR world and doing uh, these uh, behavioral-based attacks. And so, you know, as we're looking at IOCs, I also like to describe, you know, behaviors of compromise. Because IOCs in, in today's world generally means this atomic indicator. When somebody says, give me the IOCs, they expect a list of things, like hashes and IP addresses and domains. But when you, if it's so for my IR folks in here, my friends discuss, this is what we need. We need behaviors of compromise, because this is what's going to help us detect the next attack. All right? And these are just examples. I won't read through them. But you can see the, the idea here. And this is a lot of what the you know, EDR products are trying to figure out is how can we uh, uh, you know, get these behavioral analysis down and find out what is bad. Uh, you know, old school, and then we, I used to you know, use a lot to kind of explain what a bad behavior is, is executing out of the recycle bin. That shouldn't happen, right? And so those are the type of behaviors that we can look for, and those are the things that we need to start triggering on as opposed to just looking for atomic indicators. Now, this has evolved, and one vendor uh, that uh, has, has come up with indicators of attacks and started using this term. So we're going to go ahead and give that lip service you know, as, as you hear it. Uh, I, I like that you know, because I've been talking about behavioral compromise uh, uh, instead of IOCs, BOCs, then they come up with IOAs. So they've got a lot more but, uh, marketing budget, so I'm sure that you'll probably hear indicators of attack and, as opposed to uh, behaviors of compromise by Xavier Ash. You'll hear indicators of attack by, uh, by uh, CrowdStrike. Um, but the same idea is there, is that you can uh, basically uh, uh, you know, capture the, the way that software runs and compare against uh, what known good software activity is and, and to get those actual actions down and alert on those instead. So we've gone from behavioral uh, analysis to indicators of attack, and, and then we've kind of evolved to this point where uh, MITRE has released this, uh, this uh, attack framework. And I think it's, it's really good because it, it is, it's, it's a nice evolution of where we're going. And it talks a lot about what we call techniques, tactics, and procedures, TTPs. If you want to be cool, like, oh, man, I guess my OC is because of TTPs. That's good stuff. All right, so and tactics, in general, is what is a bad guy trying to do? All right, what's their tactic here? Uh, a couple of examples here. This is from the MITRE uh, uh, website that you can uh, go take a look at. You know, trying to gain persistence, trying to execute, you know, uh, on, on a, uh, uh, a vulnerability, a privilege escalations. We can tie that together with techniques, right? So how are they doing it? So the, the, the attacker was trying to do escalation of privileges, but the, well, how do they do it? What's the technique that they use, all right? So the, my, the point of the MITRE framework is to give uh, all of us a common way of talking about this. Because if we looked at a lot of our reports, uh, when I go back to the, you know, when I had that behavioral compromise, I had some behaviors described there. Well, each of us could use different words. And when, when you wanted to like, start creating metrics about what is the most common behavior or indicator of attack, we need a common language. And that's what the minor group has done. It's given us a, a set of, of uh, uh, common languages here. We can start tagging things and understanding uh, you know, how we need to prioritize it. So uh, here's the example, kind of ties it together, right? So this is a uh, you know, register key, somebody writing to the register key. And so it gives us this level of detail. And this, you can, you can see the value of this compared to somebody wrote to uh, this particular key. How, uh, my forensics folks, how many places can you uh, start, put something in the start? Infinite. Infinite. <laughs> Cheater. 
Anybody? You want to throw out? How many different keys we got? I mean, there's the user high, the... You didn't know there was going to be a test, did you? Everybody's like, no, I'm not friends with someone. Runwads, <laughs> runx. Yep, all those things. So instead of describing those and saying that, that you know they use these different keys, uh, we can more you know more aptly describe that they could do you know they're, that they this is the, the tactic and technique that they were using. So the reason I bring this up in this talk is to really uh, you know you're probably having to deal with IRCs because you have got management says that we need to do IRCs and, and you've got regulators that expect you to do IRCs and so which IRC should you use? Well, you can start with, a, well, I've got IP addresses and I've got firewall logs, so let me do that. Or you can take a step back and say, I pay for all of this, you know, recorded future or anomaly attacks and, you know, all this security intelligence. I, I kind of have a pretty good idea of who is who's after me, who my attackers might be. And I can look at the tactics and techniques that they have previously used, and then I can prioritize it. And I can say, hey, boss, we don't have a good way of looking for file hashes and and uh, and, and or register, uh, knowing when my run registry tree has been edited. So I need investment here, and here's the proof that we need some type of tool. Is that look at all of these groups, and I think that, uh, that's a slide that I lost when I was editing this earlier. Is that on the MITRE site? This, you can go through all of the different attack groups, and they show like just just like this. They show the different tactics and techniques that have been used. You say if you. You know, see, so if you are afraid of uh, the fuzzy wasn't there, and you want us to defend against it, uh, we need a tool to be able to detect these attacks and techniques. And I've got this highlighted for you. Uh, they've got, a, uh, if you haven't been to the MITRE site yet, they've got this nice, uh, they've got this screen up, uh, and this like flexible little GitHub application that you can create your own little colors and, and draw your own little maps, and uh, success. You get all of your your your, your projects funded. All right, so. So which one is it? Is it T T TTPs or IOCs, right? Well, let's look, there, you can use both, right? I don't want you to go back to this and saying, well, Xavier said IOCs are crap, so we should stop using them, all right? I say that IOCs are, are crap, so you should minimize using them. But uh, this is a tool, multi-scanner here has been published uh, by the miners, one that's on the MITRE GitHub as well, uh, and will allow you to, to kind of mix and match and start playing around with being able to use TTPs and IOCs. Woo All right, so in summary, so IOC matching is, you know, a, a necessary evil. There are some times we can provide you so with some extreme high fidelity stuff. There are lots of places where it gives you middling fidelity and can really throw off metrics and the understanding of others about how bad things are. Very atomic, very situational. Make sure that you do that, that you're using the, the, the IOCs appropriately. TTP analytics. This is where you are, are, are stepping, you know, up a level and really talking about what the attacker is trying to do and how they are doing it. And this is allows for a uh, you know more uh, you know broader conversation on the on protecting your enterprise and uh, allows for uh, you know lower. Quanti you know, lower quantity, but higher quality results. All right. Well, I only had a couple of you fall asleep. I appreciate you staying and uh, sticking around. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know, you have to, to me, I'll be around for the rest of the day, hoping that my, my blue ticket gives me something really cool. Um, but uh, otherwise, thank you very much.